Income Tax 2023-2024, American Opportunity Credit Introduction. Get ready and some coffee, because the only thing certain about life is death and taxes. And the only thing certain about death is as soon as you go down, the proverbial financial vultures will come in and pick your bones clean. The largest vulture, of course, being the government taxing the prime meat off those bare bones. Okay, that got a little dark. Anyways, let's get into it. Most of this information can be found in Publication 970, Tax Benefits for Education Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, it's basically that funny income statement ending not at net income, but rather at taxable income taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our trust me i'm an accountant product line yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. But it's not the end of the story. It's only halfway through the story. We have the second half of the income tax formula, taking that taxable income, calculating the tax based on it, not using a flat tax, but rather a progressive tax type of system and possibly some income subject to other rates other than ordinary income. But we've talked about that in prior presentations or courses we're then going to be at the tax before credits and other taxes and then of course we have to apply out those credits and other taxes the other taxes could include things such as the self-employment tax if you have a schedule c type of business we're focused here on the credits remembering credits are good like deductions but Deductions are above the line in the income statement half of the income tax formula, decreasing the taxable income. The only benefit you get then being based on the tax rates that you are in, the tax brackets that you are in. Whereas if you got a dollar credit, you get the full benefit of that dollar credit if you had enough tax liability to take advantage of that dollar credit if the dollar credit was up here in the non-refundable types of credits, which would then get us to the total tax. Then we have the payments, which of course are the withholdings on the W-2s and the estimated tax payments that we have already paid for the year and the refundable credits, where if we have that same dollar of a credit, we might still get a benefit from it, even if we had no tax liability to consume it, because in that case, the non-refundable credits are working more like a social welfare or benefit program as opposed to taxes. And that would finally get us to the tax refund or tax due. We're looking at education or credits related to education, which typically means that someone in the family, taxpayer, spouse, dependent, usually go into some kind of school, secondary education, such as college, in which case the institution will typically be giving a form 1098T, not a 1099. It's not representing income that we have to report, but rather more similar to the reporting on mortgage interest. It's giving us information about something that possibly could be a tax benefit, that being the payments we made for education, which could go towards the, the credits that we're focused in on now, or in some cases, you might have a deduction. The general order of operations for us is to see Form 8863 will help us out if we can get the credits because credits are usually more beneficial than a deduction. And the bigger credit is usually the American Opportunity Credit. If we can't get that, then we might go for the Lifetime Learning Credit. If we can't get that, we might see if the expenses that we incurred for education can be deducted in some other location. This is page two of the Form 1040 where we're at the credits area 
uh, on the second page of the Form 1040. All right, introduction. For 2023, there are two tax credits available to you. Uh, offset the cost of higher education by reducing the amount of your income tax. Now, remember, just to point this out, obviously, from a logistical perspective or the rationale behind these credits is so that people are incentivized to go to school. And one of the arguments for us subsidizing school, which is what is happening, our tax dollars are going to finance these educational institutions so that so that they can basically help more people to go to the schools. What ends up happening, of course, in practice is that the tuitions for the schools go up and you end up with bloat in the school because anything that is subsidized by the government, that's basically what happens. So just to note from a policy perspective, what are the pros and cons of doing this type of thing, of subsidizing, in essence, the schools? The argument is that the more people that we have basically educated from an economic standpoint, there's positive externalities because once they go to work, if they can improve the output, then econ the economic pie grows and therefore everybody benefits from it, which is kind of a reasonable argument from an economic standpoint. But on the downside, of course, the educational institutions are not acting like in a competitive market in a similar fashion as they would if they weren't subsidized, but are rather going after these subsidized dollars in kind of weird ways, which leads to inefficient uh, inefficient fin uh, educational institutions, which is kind of what we're looking at right now. So the deterioration in the institutions to some degree might be a result, I would think a result to some extent of the subsidization of the institutions, which allows for bloat and decrease in quality. So there's, those are kind of like the pros and cons just to think of from a policy standpoint kind of going forward. But in any case, they are the American Opportunity Credit, uh, this chapter, and the Lifetime Learning Credit, which is going to be Chapter 3. So we're going to first look at the American Opportunity Credit, which is the more stringent of the two credits, the one more difficult to qualify for, the one, if you could qualify, that will typically provide more benefits. So this chapter explains who can claim the American Opportunity Credit, what expenses qualify for the credit, who is an eligible student, who can claim a dependent's expenses, how to figure the credit, how to claim the credit, and when the credit must be repaid. All right, so what is the tax benefit of the American Opportunity Credit? For 2023, you may be able to claim a credit up to $2,500 for adjusted qualified education expenses paid for each student who qualifies for the American Opportunity Credit. So we have the limit of 2,500, so we can compare that to the lifetime learning credit, but also note that it's not per return in this case, it's per student. Remember, we could have like, whoever's on the tax return could possibly be going to school. So we have the taxpayer, we've got the spouse, we've got multiple kids that could be going to school at any given time, in which case the 2,500 is the maximum for, for each of those uh, students, for each student, okay. So a tax credit reduces the amount of income tax you may have to pay, of course, we know that. Unlike a deduction, which reduces the amount of income subject to tax, a credit directly reduces the tax itself. So as we saw the tax, if you had a dollar credit versus a dollar deduction, the dollar credit would be more beneficial. Unfortunately, it's not always as easy, however, to be thinking, should I be looking at a credit versus a deduction? because oftentimes the credits have other complications for the calculations, such as a limit in terms of how much you can, you can take for the credit oftentimes, AGI limitations and so on and so forth. So the generic scenario would be if you could have a full dollar of a credit versus a full dollar of a deduction, the credit would be more beneficial. But in the actual calculation, if I had expenses, do I get the full dollar of expenses in a credit or, there, or is there some more complex calculation due to uh, income phase outs and whatnot versus how much credit I would or how much deduction I would get on the deduction side of things and so on. So it's actually a little bit more complicated sometimes in the calculations, but that's the general idea. So 40% 
of the American Opportunity Credit may be refundable. This means that if the refundable portion of your credit is more than your tax, the excess will be refunded to you. So in other words, this is the credit that has a refundable portion to it. So this could be an advantage, especially to people that maybe are claiming their own education expenses. Possibly you're supporting yourself so you're not a dependent on your parent's tax return. If you're a full-time student, you would think your income would be relatively low considering you're spending a bunch of time in school. And therefore, therefore, you're, you, if you have the low income, you might not be able to take advantage of the credit because you have no tax liability. That's why there's a refundable portion to it. So you still might get a benefit in that case, even though your tax liability is low. Remembering that the refundable portion means that you're treating it more like a welfare birth benefit program as opposed to a, a tax reduction. So 40%. So this means that if the refundable portion of your credit is more than your tax, the excess will be refunded to you. Note, it's not really a refund in that case because you didn't pay any taxes. They're not refunding anything to you. If you didn't get any withholdings out of your W-2 or make estimated tax payments, what they're doing is giving you a benefit type of program. I only point that out because I think it's important for us to kind of understand, you know, what is actually happening here uh, on it. So I think the term, I kind of feel like they should change the terminology a little bit to, so that it would be more clear because I think definitions and words are being greatly abused and leading to confusion these days and in legal situations and like tax law, the definitions are quite important if you want to try to have any fruitful conversation about anything. But in any case, so your allowable American opportunity credit may be limited by the amount of your income. Also, the non-refundable part of the credit may be limited by the amount of your tax. So that's the non-refundable part. So overview of the American Opportunity Credit for 2023. You can see table 2-1 for the basics of this credit. Well, we might look at that later, giving us that little chart again. The details are discussed in this chapter. Can you claim more than one education credit this year? So for each student, you can elect for any year only one of the credits. So again, you might have multiple students on a tax return, but for each individual student, you have to claim one of the credits. You, you can't take the same dollar amounts, of course, and double dip, claim multiple credits for it. And you might think, well, I can take part of the education expenses and claim them for one credit and part of the education expenses for the same student claim for another credit. Well, you can't really do that because of the way the credits are put together because we're trying to determine the expenses for tuition per student to determine the eligibility or maximum amount of each of the credits. So for example, if you elect to claim the American Opportunity Credit for a dependent on your 2023 tax return, you can't use the same dependents qualified education expenses to figure the lifetime learning credit, okay? Obviously. So if you pay qualified education expenses for more than one student in the same year, you can choose to claim the American Opportunity Credit on a per student per year basis. So per student per year. So if you pay qualified education expenses for a student or students for whom you don't claim the American Opportunity Credit, you can use the adjusted qualified education expenses of that student or those students to figure your lifetime learning credit. So in other words, if you have two students, you might be able then to say, I'm going to have both students. They haven't completed their four years. They both qualify for the American Opportunity Credit. So my, maybe then I can use the American Opportunity Credit for both of them since they're separate students. But maybe one of the students qualify for the American Opportunity Credit, but the other student doesn't, but still qualifies for the other one, the lifetime learning. So in that case, you might have one credit for the American Opportunity, one for the lifetime learning. If both of them do not qualify for the American Opportunity, but both do qualify for the lifetime learning, you might be out of luck in that case to the degree that the lifetime learning credit could be limited in a maximum per return rather than on, on a per student uh, situation. All right. So this means that, for example, you can claim the American Opportunity Credit for one student and the Lifetime Learning Credit for another student in the same year. Now, obviously, with these calculations, you're going to say, well, this is getting complicated. I can run different scenarios. This could take me all day just to figure this out. But the software, of course, will help with this. And you can follow the general rules and conventions being 
that the American Opportunity Credit is usually more beneficial if you qualify for that than the Lifetime Learning Credit and so on and so forth, which is why it's on the same tax form, basically treated almost as though they're one credit, even though they're kind of like two. So differences between the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credits. What's the difference between these things, man? So there are several differences between these two credits I'll have you know. For example, you can claim the American Opportunity Credit based on the same student's expenses for no, no more than four years. So we have that four-year limitation. However, there is no limit to the number of years for which you can claim the Lifetime Learning Credit based on the same student's expenses. So if you get like a multiple choice question and it's like, which one of these two credits uh, can, can you claim the credit for more than four years? It's the one that's called lifetime, lifetime learning credit. So the, the, it used to be at one point in time, the, the lawmakers tried to make names of things actually match the thing that, that they're trying to do. Unlike like current laws, they don't do that anymore. Like you might've heard of the, the current tax law, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, has nothing to do with reducing inflation. It used to be that you can look at the name and like, ah, hey, maybe this has to do with some kind of education learning and for lifetime as opposed to four years, just by the name, but they don't do that anymore. Anyway, the differences between these credits are shown in the appendix near the end of this publication. So tip, if you claim the American Opportunity Credit for any student, you can choose between using that student's adjusted qualified education expenses for the American Opportunity Credit or the Lifetime Learning Credit. If you have the choice, the American Opportunity Credit will always be greater. Always, they say. So it's not like an either or I got to use the software, figure it out. If they qualify for the American Opportunity, that's probably the way to go. And they say always right there. That's a key term. Let me just double check that. So if you have the choice, the American Opportunity Credit, always be greater. Okay. So form 8862 may be required. So if your American Opportunity Credit was denied or reduced for any reason other than a math or clerical error for any tax year beginning after 2015, you must attach a completed form 8862 to your tax return for the next tax year for which you claim the credit. You can see form 8862 and its instructions for details if that follows. Now we saw a table comparing the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning. We're just going to summarize the American Opportunity Credit, the one that's more stringent, the one that always would give you a bigger benefit, as they say, if you would qualify for it. What are those qualifications? I'll run through them fairly quickly because we saw the table last time. The maximum credit, up to 2,500 credit per eligible student, per eligible student. A limit on modified adjusted gross income. So you got 180,000 if married filing joint, 90,000 if single head of household or qualified surviving spouse, refundable or non-refundable. 40% of the credit may be refundable. So number of years of post-secondary education. Here we go. On available only if the student had not completed the first four years of post-secondary education before 2023, generally the freshman through senior years determined by the eligible educational institution, not including academic credit awards solely because of the student's performance on proficiency exams. So in other words, you're, you're, you're typically four years, uh, freshman through senior years, and those years are typically determined by the institution based on the number of credits that you have completed, which is different than the next one, which is the number of years for the credit available only if you, if uh, for four tax years. So in other words, you could be going to school for 10 years, right? It took me over four years to go to school. I was not the brightest of folk, brightest of people when I started the educational process. I still don't claim to be the brightest of people, but you know, so if you, if it takes you longer than the four years to go through uh, the schooling process, then you, you could still have the number of years, the credits available for four, even though you haven't gone through the freshman through senior years as defined by the educational institution. All right. What's the type of the program required? The student must be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized ed uh, education credential. Number of courses. What there's a, how many courses you got to take? Well, the student must be enrolled at least half time. What does half time mean? 
Well, it's dependent on the educational institution because it's kind of difficult to say because some educational institutions have semesters versus quarters versus blah, 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 blah. But whatever they use, they should be able to tell you what half time means. Student must be enrolled at least half time for at least one academic period. Again, whatever that means for the institution, semester, quarter, whatever, that begins during 2023 or the first three months of 2024 if the qualified expenses were paid in 2023 because you usually pay for it before you start school because it's expensive, right? They don't let you like take the classes and then I'll pay you later kind of thing. They don't do that. They don't do that. So uh, felony drug convention, they kind of threw this one in there because obviously we have felony, we have drug problems. So they threw this one in there because it looks like obviously all the people are going to the school campuses in order to sell drugs, which is not, that's not really, I think, I know they're probably run by the cartels these days. It kind of looks like that, that even the faculty seem like they're run by the cartel. But hey guys, you're not supposed to be selling drugs on the campuses. So as of the end of 2023, the student had not been convicted of a felony for possessing or distributing a controlled substance. So qualified expenses, tuition, required enrollment fees, and course materials that the student needs for a course of study, whether or not the materials are bought at the educational institution. So you could buy that borrowed book possibly at some other location because the educational institution totally overcharges for it. You know, you might not even need it for some of the GE stuff. You know, you take the GE classes like pass, no pass, because you got to take some cr cr crazy thing that doesn't even apply to your, your, what you're trying to do, you're trying to get a computer science degree. And they're like, you need to take this weird elective and you just take it pass, no pass. You don't even need, I'm, I'm not even sure you need the book, right? You, what are you going to fail? What are you, anyway, but you, you might be able to buy the book at a, you know, somewhere else and still be able to do that. So of course, uh, court that got off track. Where was I? Tuition required enrollment fees and course material that the student needs for a course of study, whether or not the materials are bought at the educational institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance. Then we got the payments for academic periods. Payments made in 2023 for academic periods beginning in 2023 or beginning in the first three months of 2024. There's our standard cash based system. We have to pay for it in 2023, the tax year, but we usually prepay. However, we usually only prepay for the tuition of quarter, you know, for, for three months in advance. And therefore they give us that three months grace period to actually be taking the class in 2024 when we paid it in 2023 and get the benefit in 2023. TIN needed by filing due date. Filers and students must have been issued a TIN. So that's a tax identification number, typically a social security number. If you don't have that, possibly an I-10 or something, but for the IRS, you are obviously a number. You gotta have that number, the TIN being the broad name or category of the number, which for most people is the social security number. So by the due date of their 2023 return, including extensions, educational institutions, EIN, you must provide the educational institutions employer identification number. That's like the social security number of the institution, for example, uh, for form 8863.